Why, hello. Welcome back. Up to this point, we were talking about the early church and uh, pre-Reformation, but we were talking about the Eastern part of the church, the, the part of the church that, as we sometimes summarize, spoke Greek or the, the language of a, a culture as it was developing. Um, now we're going to talk about the Western church. Now we're going to talk about the Western church or the, the, that little group of people that uh, sang in Latin um, came to be known as the Roman Catholic Church. Now you might be asking yourself, why Latin? How did they get to be speaking Latin? Because you are saying to yourself, I remember that in the time of Jesus, it seems like Greek was what the New Testament was written in, and that was the, the language of the people. And I know that Rome, Rome controlled Jerusalem and, and so forth. So I, if everybody spoke Greek, but the Romans were in control, when did Latin come into this whole picture? Well, Latin was already in the picture, but it wasn't the common trade language, especially in the Middle East. Alexander the Great had already come in, and Greek culture was the, the common language, and the people weren't all that quick to pick up on Latin. It's something that took hundreds of years to kick in. By that point, the year 300, 400, uh, ironically, the Roman Empire was declining, but uh, in order to help uh, all the churches of the West stay together, stay united, and be Catholic or universal, they said, well, let's all speak Latin because that's something that we have in common. When well, the East, they were continuing to speak Greek as that common language because in the East, they were more conservative. Well, here's an irony of history. The, the Latins, who were the more progressive in their generation, said, let's go with the new language of Latin rather than the old language of Greek. Well, eventually, Latin itself became a dead language where people still today speak Greek but, for example, in Greece, the progressives wound up becoming the conservatives, and the conservatives wound up becoming the progressives. Twists and turns of the fate of history, you might say. But let's talk just a little more about how the, the church became divided. There were five recognized patriarchs. Uh, there was one in Rome. There was one in Constantinople. In fact, uh, originally, the emperor of Rome moved to the east to Constantinople in order to help to defend uh, the eastern part of the empire, which was uh, more susceptible. So the, the Constantine moved to that city and renamed it Constantinople, because when you're the emperor, you can do that. Oh, all right, so that's two of the sees or places where bishops were. And then there's Antioch in Jerusalem and Alexandria in Egypt. Now, Alexandria was where a famous library was housed, and it was sort of the, uh, the liberal, non-literal school of Bible interpretation, where Antioch was the more conservative of those. So there was quite a difference between Antioch and Alexandria, uh, and Jerusalem was like the historical uh, center of the church. So all five of those cities, very important in their own right, now, eventually, when the church split, you notice only one of those five is in the west, as in west of Greece, and that was Rome. And uh, so when the Roman bishop tried to declare himself to be more prominent than the other four so that he could outvote the other four, the other four voted him out. And there is the division of the church between west and east. There's the Bishop of Rome, who we now know as the Pope, and there are the four patriarchs. Now, in the, in the uh, Orthodox Church, at, at this point, they believe that they cannot change anything doctrinally, uh, in the music, or anything. They can't change anything because it would take all five of the patriarchs to vote and agree to something, and the Bishop of Rome never shows up to the meetings. So he can't vote, and therefore they can't uh, officially make any changes. Well, of course, he doesn't come to the meetings because he was excommunicated by them uh, many centuries ago. But uh, uh, nonetheless, that's, uh, they, they still see the church as being divided and, uh, and missing uh, one of its p important pieces. 
So anyway, there you have the church split between West and East, not necessarily friends with one another, though the official division didn't happen until uh, the year 1000 or, or so. Uh, there was certainly a practical division. And we learned from one another, or at least the West learned from the East. The East, remember, was the, uh, the, the more conservatives. And yet, uh, in, in some certain ways, they were more surrounded by heresy and uh, therefore needing to, uh, to deal with cultural changes before uh, Rome was. Arianism, nighttime parades with the torches and the, the hymns and all that kind of thing. So they, they wrote these hymns that would combat Arianism in the East. And there's this guy named Hilary. He was the Bishop of Potois, or Poitiers, if you're me. Um, he happened to be exiled to go over there to Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And while he was there, he heard some of those Greek hymns, so uh, much emphasizing the Trinity and in long meter like that. And he said, uh, I think we could learn some things. Ambrose also went to the East and learned how they sang antiphonally there in the Eastern churches they had in the very early generation, uh, one group singing uh, against another. And uh, he said, well, that's just wonderful. I think we could all do that as well. Ambrose created a whole new kind of hymnody in the West that we know as Ambrosian hymns. Uh, they uh, were in uh, the same meter as Roman soldier marches um, or as those parades, you know, because what, when you are a Roman soldier, you tend to have two legs, and so you do things in multiples of two, you know, four and eight and so forth. So as you're marching, um, you sing, the ants go marching two by two. Well, maybe not. Anyway, you're singing something uh, that uh, comes out in fours and eights and, and, and so forth. And so it just makes sense to, uh, to sing a song that has uh, eight syllables. 